Hey everyone, I'm Mary Frank. I'll be teaching this workshop. There's a lot of ambient sound, as I'm sure you can tell. Uh, so we'll just try to work through that. So I've provided you with some example files. The structure of the course is that we'll be going through the examples. I'll be narrating those examples um, and then kind of giving you a challenge for evolving the, the sample file. A little about me, I'm a artist, designer, technologist, educator, I do it all. Um, I have spent a lot of time using Touch Designer. I've been using it for nine years now. I've used it um, for projects for stage, for projection mapping, for installations. Um, now I do architectural media installations with ESI Design. I really like it as a tool. It's great for so many things, and of course the community is really great. So throughout the course today, I hope that you will get to know your neighbors and uh, so that you can ask each other questions, especially because of the background noise. You know, if, if you miss something, ask a friend. Uh, yeah, so that's a little about me. Uh, today we'll be all, you know, take the first half hour uh, to talk a little bit about data visualization, what I think is interesting about it, some of the topics we're going to cover. Then we're going to dive into isometric data visualization. Uh, then we'll do some geographic data visualization using latitude and longitude, and then another um, technique using territories, um, by which I mean like geographic areas, right? Uh, let's see. So the isometric one, like th that's intended to be pretty fun and just to make sure that everyone's comfortable with the techniques that we're using. It's a lot of instancing. Um, so th that's just like a, a warm up and also an opportunity for you to have some fun with it. Uh, so take a moment, say hello to your neighbor, introduce yourself. All right, so now what you all came for, data visualization. So uh, this is an image by Stamen Design. I think data visualization, it's a hot topic. Everyone wants to do it. But you know, it's, it's an old discipline. It involves a lot of different things. It involves statistics. It involves uh, cognitive science, um, you know, visual design, communication design, information design. Uh, there's a lot of aspects to it. Today, we'll be focusing mostly on the representation and the, the visual design aspect and, uh, and how to do that in 3D. Uh, for a little bit of background, uh, I've put together some of my favorite uh, data visualizers, uh, just, just a handful of, um, in case, you know, just because I think it'd be great for you to, hopefully you like their work. So uh, Jon Snow, not from Game of Thrones, but the Jon Snow, like of the Victorian era, um, was a physician. And in the 1850s, uh, people didn't really have a, um, an infectious agent theory of disease, right? They thought that people got sick because of bad air and miasmas. Um, but he, like some other people at the time, had this idea that maybe people were getting infected. There was a cholera outbreak in London, and, uh, and he actually visualized the different deaths from cholera on a map. So he put like a dot on a map for like where people were dying of cholera, and he noticed that there was a concentration around a certain well. And uh, they weren't able at the time with their technology to verify that there was cholera in the water, but the data was able to point to the fact that the well was what was infecting people. So he actually became an advocate for sanitation and, you know, like, thanks to him and people like him, like, we all have much better plumbing and sanitation in our cities. Uh, let's see. One of his contemporaries, Florence Nightingale, uh, total polymath, like, writer, um, you know, she, she has, like, a lot of accomplishments to her name, um, including, like, founding nursing. Uh, she's a feminist advocate for sex workers, also a statistician. Uh, she... Uh, created these data visualizations. She also was trying to advocate for better sanitation, but in this case, like in a nursing context and in the medical field. And so she created these visualizations of um, deaths in the Crimean War. So the red triangles are representing people who died from injuries, and the blue is representing people who died from infections. And so she w was using these visualizations to make the case for better sanitation and like better medical practices. And so uh, I think that these are both great examples of how data visualization can be used for civic purposes and for convincing people, and this goes all the way back to the beginning of the discipline. Uh, let's see, so one of my, my other big heroes in data visualization is Muriel Cooper. Uh, she uh, had a background as a graphic designer and print designer and was the, one of the co-founders of the MIT Media Lab. And she was just this total visionary around three-dimensional representations of information, representing, doing data visualization connected to the internet, and um, 
designing uh, data visualization to accommodate fluctuating data, which is like you know like way way ahead of her time. Uh, she like participated in one of the first TED talks in like 1994, and I highly recommend watching her TED talk. So she's like um, really um, this kind of under celebrated visionary in terms of design for computation and design for um, data visualization. And since we're going to be doing some 3D data visualizations, I wanted to give her a big shout out. Um, and then, uh, of course, there's so many people right now doing really brilliant work in this field. Uh, I wanted to highlight Aki Ajioma. He's also associated with the MIT Media Lab. He's a the founder of the Poetic Justice Research Group there. And he did this great project called uh, the Refugee Project. And so he's visualizing uh, you know, the migrations and refugee migrations that are happening right now and in the last few years and associating that with events. Um, and then I also really love the work of Georgia Lupi. Like she uh, has recently become a partner at Pentagram. She has this um, design perspective on data visualization that it can be humanizing and human centric. She does a lot of. Um, she's famous for doing a lot of hand drawn data visualizations. This is a visualization of someone's illness over the the course of several days. And so I think that her position that data can be humanizing and can serve human ends and stories, I think is also really interesting. And it's a great pushback against the kind of like big data corporations are going to control us uh, narrative around data. Um, so these people are all really inspiring. I hope that you go on and look them up later. And, um, and I think that it's also just this great way to frame up the, the power of data visualization and that this thing that is kind of technical can also be this way to contribute to culture, to uh, contribute to, to civics. OK, uh, let's see. Here are a couple of resources I wanted to highlight. There's, a, there's like a million. These were just some things that, I, that caught my eye. So data and society. I'll switch over to my browser so we can look at that real quick. Data and Society, it's a nonprofit research institute that's advancing public understanding of the social implications of data-centric technologies and automation. They're doing really interesting work. They have meetups. They're like really brilliant and thoughtful people doing this work here. Um, and then some more like like more like graphic design and technical resources would be like the, the data viz project. So this is really cool. If you're ever wanting some inspiration, you're like, what should I, what should I do? Like maybe you should do a violin plot, or maybe you should try a uh, a funnel chart, or you know, there's just like a lot of great representations here, and I think that each of these comes with an example, some examples. So this is a great thing to browse around if you ever want some inspiration. It's very organized. Um, kind of a similar website, right? But <laughs> uh, this, um, let's see, this also has a great set of resources, and. Uh, information is beautiful. Another great project. They have a lot of great resources, different data sets that they think are interesting. And then, uh, you know, we saw that <laughs> um, we saw that great astronomy talk yesterday. I don't know if you were able to attend, but it was excellent. NASA has a ton of data. It's all available. There's um, we'll we'll talk about that a little bit as well. You can get data anywhere. Uh, I think sometimes it's really interesting to look into like people who are passionate about a subject and see what data they've compiled. So some of the data that we'll be looking at later is from this website. These are people who track fracking and oil, the oil and gas industry in the United States. And they have, they've like put this data up. And so you know, it's, it's available and it's something that they're doing as a form of advocacy. And, and we can engage with that. Uh, let's see. Oh yeah, and I wanted to also mention Natural Earth. That's another website, and they have a lot of great, um, you know, really high quality like roster and vector, um, you know, like map stuff. Map stuff. It's a technical term. Uh, okay, so let's get into it. Uh, let's start with some isometric data visualization. A couple of things before we begin. Um, so isometric projection. It's a form of orthographic projection. Who can tell us what an orthographic projection is? Come on, you, sir. Front top side. All right, great. What's different about it than perspective projection? Yeah. Triangle to shape can be measured. No vanishing point. Any anyone else? It can be. It can be measured. Right. So it it um because the the projection is you know a bunch of imaginary straight lines instead of lines that are going to a vanishing point as you're saying it means that it like lends itself really well to diagrams and um and so from an aesthetic point of view to like evolve on that from like what it is what are the aesthetics of it 
that means that it kind of gives this aesthetic of, of accuracy and, and um, you know, like, like really concrete information. And so I think it's a really nice stylistic approach to data visualization because it has the sense of authority um, in terms of visual representation. So, you know, I think everyone, or like if you're at all like me, then your favorite application of isometric projection is like exploded diagrams, like this one um, of uh, like the, the NASA, NASA um, rocket engine. Uh, so here are some uh, images that I thought were like fun inspiration for this. So this is actually like a, a brand identity. And then this cute little diagram on the right is like has little people in a data visualization. I thought it was adorable. Um, so we can we can like flip back to these if we're you know as we work through our projects and we're like hmm where should I go from here? There's always that moment when you're doing something creative and you're like wait I don't know what to do next. It's always nice to look back at you know look at some inspiring imagery. Let's see, so some of the techniques that we'll start by looking at are um, looking at the orthographic camera setup. So I have a camera setup and a scene, and it is doing those, um, it's doing these things for us, right? So I, true isometric has these, oh great, now I like moused over the thing. Um, but uh, it has these 30 degree angles, or is oblique, it's like 45 degrees, so someone will be particular about that. Um, Let's see, and then we'll also be looking at instancing. Instancing is a really great way to do data visualization in Touch Designer because it allows us to, you know, combine all of our data into, you know, usually a chop, right? But it allows us to kind of collect that and then apply the data to different parameters of our of our instanced geometry. Uh, let's see. Um, so looking at some stylistic approaches, you know, talking about isometric you know, kind of like what that, what that gets us. Uh, and then how we can use materials in a nice way for this. Uh, you know, so this is more like tips and tricks stuff in Touch Designer. Looking at chop animation so we can make nice transitions. Uh, bringing in text and using a palette. So that's what we're going to jump into. So let's switch over to Touch Designer. If, you, if your files are still in a zip folder, be sure to extract your files. Um, usually, you can you can open a file while it's in a zipped folder, but then you can't like load other files, so it gets a little confusing. So I'm going to open this file, isometricdataviz.to. All right, great. So uh, we can start with the uh, the container on the far left. So this is an example of um, you know I have these different different little plates. You can see that this is an isometric projection. I have these different elements. They're animating with different patterns. I have some line work. I have text that's laid out in the 3D scene to also be projected in the same way. And so let's take a minute to like cruise around, take a look at what's going on. I've highlighted some things in pink that are things you might want to change the parameters of, but we can take a look at the whole thing here. So I'll start, um, um, I'm going to save this for a little bit later. Let's start actually with the, um, you know, I take it back. So this is a fun example, but I'm going to start with a simpler one. So I'm going to go back up. I'm going to go to the ISO example one, because this is just one thing, so it's a little bit simpler. All right, so here we have some geometry components, and they're the different elements in our scene. You know, we can like kind of quickly toggle some things on and off. Uh, whoops, I had them all selected. You know, so we can see what's what. Uh, there is, are some chops here. These are generating our instance data. There's some. We're going to use that later. We have some materials up here. These are all Fong materials. Uh, we have a camera with a null parent and a null look at. Uh, and we're rendering everything and we're putting it out. So let's start with the camera. Let's look at the parameters of the camera. We can see, you know, uh, we can toggle this bullseye looking thing at the top right of our parameters. And you can see what, you know, is changed here from the default. So you can see that this is an orthographic projection. So not perspective, it's orthographic. Uh, I've set the width. You can change the width you know, as you like. 
uh, it has a look at, so it's pointing at the center of the scene. And then I have those, um, those rotations. So it's rotated 30 degrees on the x, 30 degrees on the y, and then it's tipped up 45 degrees um, in, in z. And it's, um, so then we can just arrange all of our objects in the scene, and they'll you know, be rendered in this nice, or nice orthographic style. The next thing I want to show you are the materials. Um, so to get this shading, there's kind of this, you know, it's like one color on the top, one color on the side, but it's all totally flat shaded. Uh, what I've done here is I've taken the, I've set the emit to be my base color, and then I'm using rim lights to create different shading on the top and the sides. So I could just change this color, and that's a little much. Um, and so the the shading on the top and the sides is just uh, you know controlled by this one color. So that's this you know flat shaded approach to um, to rendering here. Um, and so now we can look at some of the elements of the scene. We have this plate. This is really just a framing element. It's kind of nice to have something to. Uh, you know, the, these rectilinear elements do a lot to illustrate the projection that we're using, um, you know, and to, to sh let people understand that sense of parallel lines in the, s in the space. So it's a nice compositional tool. Uh, then we have the, the graph itself. So these are the elements that are being instanced. If we go inside, we can see that there's a box, pretty simple. Uh, and it's been moved so that it's resting. It's the bottom of it is at 0, and then it goes up from there. And then we also have this little line element um, that, that goes around it. It's just a graphic element. And we are instancing this box and using the, uh, the scale to kind of drive the height of this. So if this is a bar map, we're basically using the scale in Y to show volume, right? To, sh to show an increase in, in the number. Let's see. So here we have our chops that are generating this data. So we're just generating information here. We're not using a data source so far. Uh, I'm using a pattern to create a count and to describe the x position, so just going from left to right, an even linear increase. Then using another, um, another pattern to kind of create this, this traveling wave. And I'm using a filter to smooth out that transition. So if I bypass the filter, then it just becomes um, you know, very chunky. Uh, and there isn't any transition, whereas this makes the, uh, the design a lot more readable as we all learned in David's talk yesterday. So um, then this last one, this pattern, is again creating a linear ramp. I actually could probably, no, this has to be um, uh, uh, integers, because these are the, um, the numbers that we're using for our texture lookup. So that's the next element that we'll look at in our scene. Uh, these uh, are, I have these, these cute little numbers numbering off our boxes. So to use these labels, I'm actually using instance textures. It's something you can get on NVIDIA, but you can't really get it on Mac. So I apologize to the Mac people today. Uh, you, you, you can find another way. But this is just a way to take a little card and put a number on it using the, uh, the texture index and, and the instance textures. So here are all of my number textures, and then I'm Instancing them into the scene, so they're all like all of the text is also laid out in 3D and exists in 3D. Um, okay, so uh, take like 10 minutes to cruise around, play around with this. Maybe you'll change the colors, maybe you'll change the text in the scene, have a little bit of fun with it. I'll walk around and just kind of uh, check in with you guys. So if you have any questions about what I just described, just uh, just grab me and, and ask me. So now that you've had a chance to look through this, I'm going to kind of quickly try to do some live coding for you and show you how I set this up. So just like kind of be like, take it from the top. Um, I, I kind of hate live coding because I always make mistakes. So um, just bear with me. Uh, actually, I'm gonna, so I'm going to start with a container. Containers are great components for, you know, if later we want to add interaction or something like that. 
then we would want to use a container. I'm going to copy my camera setup over just because um, it took me a minute to like figure that out. So I'm just going to reuse it. But let's say that I want to make all of the geometry in the scene from scratch. Um, I can go to make a geometry component. So this is going to contain our meshes and whatever else we want to put in here. Um, so I will make a box inside of my geometry component. This will be the plate that's in the scene. On my box, I'm going to turn on my render and display flags. And I'm going to make this kind of small. It doesn't need to be this big. Like, um, let's say. Um, and then I'm going to split my screen so I can look at this. That's right. In my, the way that my cameras are set up, Y is up. So I don't want this to be this tall. I want it to be shorter. So I want it to be 0.5 and x and z, and then 0.1 in y. Now let's give it a material. I'm going to create a Fong material. And I'm going to put it next to it. In my Fong parameters, under the first tab, so the RGB tab, I'm going to change the emission. An emission just means like this, it has like this baseline color, whether or not there's light in the scene. I'm a big fan of materials-based uh, shading, and I often don't even use any lights. So I just kind of describe how something should look with the material only. And that is computationally more efficient. In this scene, it really doesn't matter because <laughs> we're using such simple geometry. But um, you know, sometimes it does matter. Sometimes it's handy. So I'm going to pick this nice. Nice teal color. Teal's been really speaking to me recently. Um, I'm going to, sorry, I'm going to move this over. No, I'm going to close this. Um, I'm going to apply my material to my geometry component. I can just drag and drop and select parameter material. And now the material's been applied to the geometry component. To get that shading that we were looking at in the other scene, I'm going to go back to my Fong parameters. And I'm going to go to the rim tab of the Fong parameters. Here, I'm going to turn on my rim lights. And so now we have this, you know, this different color, this lighter color on the top. I turn on both rim lights. They're currently both in the same angle. So I'm going to take the second one, and I'm going to move it. Um, let's see. I like it lighting up the front like that. I want the top to be lighter, so I'm going to make that a little bit brighter. Maybe I'll keep making it brighter. There, I like that. It's really clean. Uh, OK, so now let's, let's put something on top of our box. So I'm going to make another geometry component. This is going to hold our instances. This time, I'm going to make, let's make a, a cylinder, so, which is called a tube. Got my tube. I'm going to turn on my render and display flags for my tube sop. And I'm going to make this the radius smaller. I'll take this down to 0.1. We might want to go even smaller. The other thing that I'm going to do right now, this is centered at 0, 0, which means that it goes below and above uh, its axis. axis. So I'm going to make the center half of its height, which is 0.5. If I wanted to be clever, I could make this an expression. You guys don't have to do this, but if, you're, if you like Python, you want to try Python expression, I can say me dot par, which is this operator's parameter. We're going to make a reference to another parameter. Parameter dot height. How did I know what that parameter was? If you mouse over this parameter, you see the keyword that is the parameter name. So if I press Enter, now it's the whole height. Wait, that's not what I wanted. I wanted it to be half of the height. So I'm going to say multiply times 0.5. So I'm going to use a scalar. All right, so now, no matter what I set the height to, it's going to stay with its bottom at 0. So that's kind of handy. Saves me work later. Because I'm probably going to change that. All right, so we have our tube set up in our second geometry component. 
And now I'm going to go back up in the network. And yeah, we're probably going to want to change the size of that. But we'll save that for, um, for a little bit later. Now I'm going to make some chop data to describe the positions of my instances. I'm going to start with the pattern chop. The pattern chop, you know, by default, it has 1,000 samples. When we're instancing using chop data, the number of instances is based by default on the number of samples in the chop. So I don't want 1,000 things. I'm going to take this down to 12. Um, I'm going to give this a significant name so that I stay sane while I, while I work on the computer. I'm going to call this TX, so that's going to remind me that this is describing the X transformation of my instances. Um, I'm going to change this from a sine wave to a ramp. So this is just going to be a linear ramp going up. So this is great for making things go in a row from left to right. I'm going to put a merge on the end of this, because I know we're going to add more later. And I'm going to go to my geometry component, turn on instancing, drop the chop that I want to use for instancing, which is this merge chop. And then I'm going to, I can choose channels from that with this little handy arrow, or I can just type them in, TX. So you know, like my scales are all off right now in my scene. So let's fix that. I'm going to split my screen again so that I can, you know, there's a few different, you know, you, everyone has a different way to look at what they're doing while they're working somewhere else. That's how I'm going to do it right now. So I'm going to go into my geometry component. I'm going to make this smaller. So I'm going to bring the height down. Let's make this like 0.25. That's a nice number. And we'll take the radius down a little bit. I'm going to take that down to 0 0.05. Uh, I'm also going to change my plate dimensions. Uh, just to get this a little bit nicer. I want, you know, so with our cylinder, we made it so that the cylinder is resting at 0. I want the plate to rest below 0. So I'm going to do the same thing that we did for the cylinder. I'm going to change the center so that it's based on the height me dot par dot height. Or is that, is that height? What, what is it here? Size y. Huh. Throwing us for a curveball uh, times 0.5. But I want that to be the other direction, so I'm going to say negative 0.5. So if you want to see that expression again, here it is. And so now my plate is going to rest should be resting at 0. And yes, yeah, so you can see that it's beneath my cylinders now. The, the size is still not what I want. I think I want this to be longer in the x, so I can scale that up. That's, kinda, that's getting cuter. I'm going to go back up in my network. I'm going to move my cylinders in the x, move them over here onto my plane a little bit. I could also change them with, you know, here with my chop data, I could normalize that. I'm going to make this, the amplitude here, a little bit bigger so that they are spaced out in a way that I like. And now, now yeah, we're just about there. So I'll make another material. I'm just going to copy the Fong material that I did before. I'm going to copy this and apply it to my cylinders. And I'm going to give these a different color. could change my rim lights if I want. But I'll save that for later. So now I want to control the height of these cylinders. So you know, this is we're setting ourselves up for a bar graph, kind of, right? So what parameter do we want to control to to change the height? Anyone? Anyone? Let's look at our instance our instance tab of our geometry parameter. So when we're instancing, we can control all of these different attributes of our instances. Um, I think so, you know, like some people know this, some people don't know this. Let's talk about instancing for a second. 
Instancing is uh, when you copy geometry, but instead of copying it in your file on the CPU, you actually are like the graphics card is copying it when it draws it. And so that means that it's, it's a lot faster and computationally more efficient than copying something in your scene. And it also actually is efficient from a design perspective because it allows for us to do really parametric design with our instances. When you're instancing something, you're having the graphics card make the copies. And it's really easy for the graphics card to apply transformations to those copies, transformations being like the position, the scale, uh, rotations, those kinds of things. Uh, there are a lot of other things that you can control when you're instancing. You can control color. You can apply textures. Um, so there's like all of these different parameters in our instance tabs that we can control and that um, are really going to lend themselves to our, our data viz projects. So uh, this is the parameter that we're going to set out to control. We're going to control the y scale. So that's, that's going to be how tall each of these is. So we can go back to our pattern chop. And we can make, we'll copy this and paste it. This time, we're going to name the channel SY, scale Y. So it's going to control the height. And if I hook that up, nothing happens yet because we haven't told the geometry component to use that channel. So we go back to our geometry component parameters. And we set the scale Y to be controlled by the channel that we just made, SY. All right, so uh, take uh, you know, like five, 10 minutes to set that up. Maybe try some other parameters. Maybe you want to make these into uh, little cones instead of cylinders. And you know, if I went through that too fast, you can just ask me about anything that you missed. OK, cool. So let's say that we want to animate our, uh, our heights now. So how I animated that in the other one was by controlling the phase. So if I just take my mouse to the phase, you can see that it is offsetting our, um, our pattern. Uh, so I can set this to be an expression. I'm going to say use the expression. I'm going to use time. So I'm going to say me dot time dot uh, frame. Um, but I think that's going to be way too fast. So I'm going to give that a scalar. I'm going to multiply that by 0 0.01. That's kind of nice. Uh, let's see. Let's go to the square wave on our pattern chop, setting our pattern chop to be a square. Um, let's see. We want this to always be positive and not negative. So I could change the offset here. I could take this up by 1 and take the amplitude down, Do some play around with my numbers a little bit. But uh, let's say I want to smooth this out. There are a couple of different operators that we could use to smooth out this animation. I'm a big fan of the lag chop and the filter chop. In this case, let's use the filter chop. So I'm going to insert an operator here after my pattern chop. And I'm going to insert a filter. Filter. Uh, so that's not doing what I wanted it to do, but that's OK. I can go to common. And I can see that time slicing is turned on. So what it's doing is taking one sample out of my whole set of samples. So I'm going to turn time slicing off. Now, we're kind of not seeing anything because it's smoothing across all of our samples. By default, filter is going to smooth from sample to sample. But we actually want it to smooth over time. And so I'm going to turn on this parameter, filter per sample. So now it's filtering each sample within the chop over time. And the, the filter width is kind of big. It's a whole second. So I'm going to take this down to a tenth of a second. And uh, don't like that. Going to take that up a little bit. That's, that's nice. That almost feels like some kind of machine right now. So if we were using a lag chop, some of the same parameters are there and apply. So if I were to connect the lag chop, again, I would need to turn off time slice. And I would need to turn on 
lag per sample so that it's lagging on a per sample basis over time instead of across the samples inside the operator. So that's a nice smoothing function to do te temporal smoothing. Uh, yeah, so that's the basis of the scene that we were looking at. Now let's look at, let's move to a different example. We're going to go to the example that's actually using data. So we're going to go back up in our, our project file. And we're going to go to this example. This is using all the same techniques as in our other scene. But this time, we're actually using data. This is data from a website, nothing fancy. I literally just like copied and pasted the data into a, a DAT. This is rainfall in Los, Los Angeles. And this is a good data set to visualize, because month to month in LA, there's very different amounts of rainfall. It's completely dry in the summer, only rains in the winter. And then from year to year, it's, it's quite variable. Like There's drought years, and there's flood years. And so as a data set, it's, kind of, it's more fun to data, like, visualize than you know, like San Francisco. The weather's the same all the time. You know, so so uh, <laughs> you, you might want to choose your data based on its variability and you know, it, it being dynamic. Uh, so here, basically the same setup that we looked at before. But this time, we're bringing in this data that's down here. Zooming in, I have, this is the data that I copied and pasted from this website, the lalmanac.com. And so I'm doing a little bit to clean up the data. This is always part of the process. So you know, I'm converting this tab-separated data into a table. There's, uh, you know, like I, I wanted to skip this year because the data is incomplete. So I'm selecting that out further down the line. Um, so I've, I've gotten rid of the, the current year because that data is incomplete. And then there's also, if we look at the data, there are these, uh, instead of numbers, it, it has a T. So that means trace. There were trace amounts of rainfall, but not enough to measure. So I need to convert that to be something that can be used in my you know, in, in my setup here. So I need to use change t to a number, because t is going to mess up my, my setup, right? So I'm just using a substitute dat, and I'm taking the letter t, and I'm turning it into a 0 only when it's exactly the letter, the capital T. So I don't want it to change on, like, season total over here. There's a capital T, but I want to keep that as it is. So, so data processing is, like, always part of data visualization. And so there are a couple of simple tools that we can use within Touch Designer to do what we need to do sometimes, you know, like selecting what we want, rearranging our data within a table, or you know, substituting one thing for another thing. But if you want to go further, you might need to use some Python. And we'll take a really, really quick look at that, um, some Python data parsing later on in the geographic section. Yeah, so now I have this, this table. I have a lot of information here. I have months. Conveniently, there are 12 of them. Uh, I have years. I, you know, uh, and there's like a total. Maybe I could bring that in somehow. So I have this, uh, this dat selecting a year. So it's just choosing one thing. And then, uh, let's see, this is a null because uh, it's nice practice sometimes to terminate you know, as, as your work with a null so that it can be referenced somewhere else, and then you can keep changing things upstream of that reference. So this is getting used, this is getting turned into chop data. I'm using a dat to chop. So now it fits right in with all of the chop data that we've been playing around with. I'm renaming it to be SY. We've been using SY to control the height. This makes total sense. Still filtering it to make this transition smooth. Lovely, lovely. Now we can cycle through different years and see the different, uh, you know, the different amounts of rain per month in this really clean way. I'm counting through the years just with this. This is old school, you guys. I'm using an LFO and a count chop. So um, that's how you know I've, I'm an OG. Let's see what else. What else? So now let's look at the labels, right? So uh, I have this label. We have our our labels that are. Let's see, sorry. This is just a piece of geometry. It's a card that's holding our texture data. So instead of the numbers in, in our previous scene, we're just counting 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. Here we have the, the months. And so I've set the text parameter of the text top 
to be an expression. And so this expression is referencing the table that we have here. I'm going to split my screen again. So if I go up in my network in my other screen, remember we have this handy uh, handy dat, null dat. So everywhere that I want to reference this, I'm going to reference this null. And so I have this expression, find the operator named current data, and take the first row, row 0, and then use my digits, the operator digits, to index into the table. And so this is letting me like really easily put all of the name, the months, into these textures. Pretty sweet. Uh, so th those are our month labels. What other labels do we have? We have, um, so I keep going in here. I have some more textures. These are the, the numerical, rep you know, this, these are the, this is the amount of rainfall in inches. And so that's also being dynamically referenced. It's using the same expression, but just, you know, pulling that in from a different part of the table. So if we look at our table, you know, we were pulling the months in with the, the first row, and we're getting the numbers from the second row, the f which is index one. Yeah, so that's great. It's all dynamically updating. Uh, and then you can see that we're positioning the rainfall number to be like to change in position with the height of the bar. Uh, so how are we doing that? We are using the um, Sorry, I'm going to close this. We're using the same setup. It's all the same paradigm, right? So we're using the, the same kind of number that is using the, the height to control the height. We're actually just applying a scalar to that and using that to control the position. So we're just turning that back into position data just because scaling and position are a little bit different. So um, yeah, so it's, it's fully parametric, right? If we, I was like, if, if this didn't fit the scene very well, if the data was different, like right now this frames up pretty nicely, right? Maybe I would need to actually put a scalar on here and be like, like maybe my bars are too small. So I could use a math chop and, you know, or maybe my bars are too big, right? I could simply like multiply this by a number and then that's controlling the text position as well as the height. You know, or like maybe if they're just the rainfall numbers are really small and we want to exaggerate them to see our differences more easily, you know, we could multiply that by three. So then we get a more dramatic difference between our numbers in our the way that we're representing them. You know, when you see those stock market graphs and it's like, oh, the stock market went way down, but it's like it actually went just between, you know, the difference wasn't that big, but the way they're graphing it makes it look really scary. Uh, you know, you ha you now have the power to do that kind of thing in your own representations. <laughs> All right, so let's take another, uh, let's take 15 minutes um, to, I'm going to challenge you to find, to go on onto the internet and find different um, month data. So like maybe that's weather data for a different city. Maybe it's, you know, like, uh, I don't know. I always have this kind of dark, I'm, I'm like, maybe it's the number of people who died in a month. Sorry, <laughs> it's really dark though. Uh, maybe you can think of something more pleasant to represent. Um, yeah, so you know, take a little bit of time, like find some more data. Keep it keep it simple. Keep it something that you can just like copy and paste into a dat. Don't overdo it. And um, and so plug in some different data. The other challenge, uh, if you want another challenge, is going to be to uh, to do some color coding, to do some math. Maybe it's like uh, we have these season totals as well. So maybe you can do something creative with that. Maybe you can bring this in as another label. So maybe you add another label that's showing the season total with the year. Or maybe you're doing like, if you're feeling advanced, uh, then like maybe in a year where the season total is high, it's a different color for all of them. You know, and so there's some other, another layer of information that we're bringing in. All right, so we'll take at least 15 minutes to do that, up to, up to half an hour. I wanted to spend like an hour per section. And I think we're, we're, doing, we're going along at a good clip. So, um, so yeah, get creative. Um, so I'm going to do a demo for the Mac users. A lot of you are on PC, but a lot of you are on Mac. So for the Mac users, I'm going to show how to manually associate the textures for the, the month labels. So if you're not on a Mac, you don't have to listen to this. You can keep doing what you're doing. Uh, and for the Mac users, this is also optional. But if you care, like, well, that's what I'll be doing. Uh, OK. 
So for the Mac peeps, uh, so if I go into my label textures here, this is where I have my months. So I, I'm already using you know, a reference, and I'm making a texture for every month. So the thing that I would need to do to replicate this look without using instance texturing is going to be to make a, uh, a rectangle and a, and a material to associate that texture with each rectangle. So um, let's see. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my rectangle that I have in the labels data. I'm going to turn this off because, whoops, I'm going to turn this off because we're going to now do this this other way. So in label textures, let's see, label textures is a base. I'm going to change the label textures base to be a geometry component because I want to render it. And if you've never done this before, you are about to feel drunk with power. If you right click, you can change the component type. Where is it? Change component type. So I'm going to change this from a base to a geometry component. And there's the geometry component. So voila, wave of a wand, what it was a base is now a geometry component, and therefore something I can render. Uh, in order to render it, I'll need to turn on my render and display flags. All right, next step. Let's paste in that rectangle. I'm going to turn off the render and display flags because we're going to use this a few different times. I'm going to make a material sop. Uh, and I'm going to make a constant material. Constant materials are the cheapest to render. So when in doubt, you can go with a constant material. Uh, and I'm going to apply this texture to this constant. Let's check up in our scene. How's this going? Where are we, et cetera? Oh, yeah, I didn't turn on my render flag for my material. This might be underneath something else. So I'm going to move this around until I can see it. I think it might be underneath something. Oh, there it is. So I'm going to move this forward. OK, so it's, it's black. What's happening? Um, let's see. I'm going to make this material. I'm going to make it. I'm going to turn on blending. And I'm going to make it additive. And oh, I don't think I actually applied it to anything. There we go. <laughs> OK. Uh, and I'm going to discard the alpha values. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that's pretty good. Let's see. So now I can actually place this in my scene. I want it to be, uh, I want this to be on the x, the z x plane. Now it's kind of flipped around. Do a transform. I think this is flipped over. And I'm going to bring this back down. All right, so I've like nudged this into the position that I want. And so now I'm going to make a bunch, a bunch of them. I am just going to copy and paste this. Yes. Oh, wait. First, I'm going to uh, make this associate with the texture that I want. I'm going to copy these all together. And then I think they should keep their references. So copy, paste, 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 paste. Um, and then I could probably do something smart to like make these lay out in the right way, but just to keep this really brief, you know, I'm going to show you like you could position them manually, or we can actually use that nice data that we made up here because we have all the 
the positions that we want over here. So let's use an expression. I'm going to select all of these. And I'm going to put an expression in the TX parameter. I'm going to reference this operator. I'm going to write op, uh, open parentheses, uh, quote, um, dot, dot, forward slash, which is like, you know, we're describing a location within our, um, within our touch patch. So INST is the name of the operator. So I'm referencing this operator, and I want to reference the channel TX. OK, got the channel. Now I want to uh, reference a sample of that, of that channel. So the sample is going to be um, uh, me.digits. So now, oh, got to be me.digits minus 1, because we start, we're doing zero indexing, the old fence post problem. So now all my labels are, oh, it's almost right. I'm going to nudge this over up here. So now I've, without using instance texturing, put my labels in the scene using the same parametric approach. So if I changed my spacing, if I want to change my spacing, it would still reference that. All right. Let's see. Let's see. So at 4 o'clock, we're going to switch to the next topic. So you have another 10 minutes with your data visualizations. So if you're still looking for data, you should probably just commit, pick some, pick some data, try to get it in there. All right, so we're going to wrap this up and move into doing some geographic data. All right, so I'm going to close this. Uh, let's see. All right, let's talk about geographic data visualization. We're going to do uh, two different kinds of geographic data visualization today. Um, these are a couple of looks that I really like, and these are all very achievable things in Touch Designer. So uh, this map by Stamen Design, they do a lot of great maps. This is a map representing Airbnb um, usage in, uh, on different blocks in San Francisco. And then on the right, this is, um, this is uh, like uh, energy use in Manhattan. And so... We were just playing with instances, right? You can imagine the, represent the map on the upper right being uh, something that we could do with instances. That would be a great application for the techniques that we've been playing around with. And so that's something that we'll look at. Uh, the map on the, on the right, this is a, a geographic map. But you could imagine this being done like with a height map, right? There's a lot of data that is, um, we're not going to get really into this today, but uh, there's a lot of data that's available as textures, right? So if you think about you know, uh, a height map of a country, or if you think about, um, there's actually a data vis visualization that I did of, uh, of plankton. And this is uh, images that I got from NASA, and it shows plankton around the world, like month to month. And so I was able to visualize uh, the plankton you know, migration around the world uh, using textures. And so we're not going to get into that much today, but there's a lot of different ways that you can bring in data and information. Um, so just as kind of a, a little bit of a disclaimer, this is a, a three-hour workshop, data visualization and geography. Uh, you know, it's, these are huge topics. And so we're not really going to get into GIS today. Uh, we're also not going to talk about map projections. We're just going to do things on, in 3D on a sphere. And we're not going to get into APIs or the image-based data stuff I was just talking about. Um, so geographic information systems, I'm actually going to let our guest expert tell you quickly uh, what they are. Would you introduce yourself and tell us about GIS? Hi, I'm Janet from Primitive. I'm just going to help Mary Craig in here for a second. So um, I did
So I, I have a question about GIS. What are some of the standard layers of geographic information that people have in GIS? There's like hydrology, there's like... Yeah, so like you, you always launch your, your basics, so your lab long, lines, your latitude, longitude lines, so that you can actually fit to our data on the physical space and map it in a projection to the world, because you don't want just a flat map. That's not a real representation of the world. So projections in the GIS world are That's awesome. That's a lot of different data types. So I think that if you want to get into this more serious, thank you so much. So if you guys are interested in getting more into mapping, I think that you should look into using GIS and, and finding, maybe you can find some workflows for bringing GIS data into Touch Designer and share that with all of us. Yeah, sure. Can anyone access Google Earth data to use in Touch Designer? Uh, so, uh, Google Earth is one thing. Google Maps, you can. There's definitely an API for that. Uh, you have to pay. You have to pay to use it, and it's based on like how many calls, you know, like like a, how many things you serve up. Uh, so I have not used the Google Maps API, but it is possible. There's also the Open Map project. So there's definitely um, there are a lot of options for using map data. So, um, but yeah, we're gonna keep it keep it shorter and sweeter in this in this workshop. Uh, let's see. So I already told you about Plankton. So these are the two different kinds of mapping we'll be working on today. So you can imagine um, a map that is based on a single point, right? So this is a, you know, these are kind of related maps. This is the most educated town in every state. A town has a latitude and longitude position. It's a single point. We're putting points on a map. That's one way to map information. Lends itself to a certain kind of information. Uh, the map on the right. These are um, counties, and so these are actually, I think that this is showing the most difficult places to live in the United States, and so the more orange a county is, the harder it is to live there. Um, and so this is, we're representing information at the county level, which is what I mean when I say a territory. So, you know, Jen was telling us about boundaries, and so boundaries between states or counties or countries um, are all a big part of mapping. And so we're going to look at um, representing data by putting a bunch of points on a map. And then after that, we'll look at representing data that's associated with a territory, like a specific shape, right? Okay. So we'll be looking at a few different things. I'm going to touch. Oh, so lightly on data parsing. Uh, I think that just from your own experience in the last 10 minutes of looking for data, you saw how many different like formats there are for data. Like, there's always kind of weird exceptions and particularities to data sets. Uh, you know, uh, you can use DATS to to do some work with your data. You know, you can also use Excel. There's a lot of a lot of tools for manipulating information. Um, Python is an excellent tool for data manipulation. So I'll show you this little little baby Python script that I used to analyze some data, just to let you know that that's a, a great avenue for parsing and manipulating data. But I'm not going to get into that as its own topic. Um, and then we'll talk more about instancing, because instancing is great. Hopefully, I've converted you all at this point. Um, we'll talk about polar coordinates and uh, polar camera animations and bringing using text in camera space, so a few more ways to label things. And, um, and we'll talk about palettes. I kind of forgot to talk about palettes last time, but we'll come back to that uh, when we have some time. Let's see. So before we get into all of this, you know this, but I just want to put the information back into your heads, make it fresh. We live on a sphere. Uh, 
so we can describe positions on the sphere um, you know, with degrees, with polar coordinates. So often in 3D, we're thinking about positions in terms of x, y, and z, which is Cartesian, Cartesian coordinate system. But if you're thinking about things spherically, then it makes a lot more sense to use polar coordinates. Uh, so you know, to use a definition, a polar coordinate system, it's a coordinate system for three-dimensional space where the position of a point is specified by three numbers, the radial distance of that point from the origin, its polar angle, and the azimuth angle. What does that mean? So if you think about flying in a plane, a lot of you flew in a plane to get here, so did I. Uh, you can think about how high the plane is. That's the radius or the distance. Uh, and then like the latitude, you know, are you traveling east? Uh, sorry, are you traveling north-south? And then the longitude, are you traveling east-west? So for the rest of us, height, latitude, and longitude are great descriptors for a polar coordinate system. Uh, let's see. So. This is so handy when we're thinking about uh, making a geographic 3D data visualization because a lot of information about our world is already in po polar coordinate systems. Like it's already, we already have a lot of data that is based in latitude and longitude. So it's like really easy to take that information and put it on a sphere. The other reason that uh, we would want to use polar coordinates in the work that we're doing today is because if we are representing a sphere, we're going to be using cameras. We use cameras in 3D. And so we will want our camera to move in a nice way around our sphere, right? We want our camera, if we want to pan over our data, we'll probably want to pan radially or like, you know, make a nice arc around. And we don't, we don't want to move straight across if we're looking at a sphere because that won't be as, as nice to look at. So we're going to use polar coordinates and motion to control our camera as well. So uh, you all have this PDF. If at some point you're like, what is theta? You can refer back to this, this handy, handy table. Oh, we're not there yet. <laughs> OK, uh, let's see. Let's go to back to Touch Designer. Uh, so we're going to start. Uh, we're, this, this globe file is like kind of going to show us some of the techniques. And then we're going to look at the actual map. Hey, look, more instances. Uh, so here I have a bunch of instances on a sphere. Let's take a look at this file. Uh, OK, so here's our geometry component. This is, this is fake data, again, fake news. Uh, so this information is coming from up here on the upper left. I have a sphere, and basically, using a sort to randomize these point numbers. And then I'm selecting, I'm basically picking 100 random points off of this sphere to, to be our pretend data. So our pretend data, um, uh, I'm combining that with random information to choose different heights. And that's becoming our instance, uh, our instance data. So just like before, we're controlling the transformation but we're controlling the x, y, and z transformations. Uh, we're also controlling the height. This time, height is in the z parameter, but that doesn't matter too much. We're doing kind of the same thing we did before. This should all be familiar so far. But we're doing a couple of new things. We're using a rotate to vector. Um, so vectors are, you can think of them as an arrow, but also it's like three, three numbers. It could be like a position. There's something kind of fun about working with spherical data because we get some interesting like opportunities for transformations and so forth because we're working in 3D on a sphere. So basically, the position that all of these are, their position on the sphere is also exactly the same as the normal, right? So the, if you are to draw an arrow from the, the middle, the center, the origin of the sphere to that position, that's also describing its orientation. So we can use that later. That's something that I want you to keep in mind as well. All right, so, so these are not only moved to their position on the sphere, they're also rotated to this vector, to the normal, so that they're pointing away on the sphere. So I'm going to take that away for a second, just so that it's really clear um, what I'm saying. 
Like, what happens if we don't do this? Then it's, it's kind of boring, right? They're just, they're all, they don't have that same orientation. So this rotate to vector is what's allowing us to get that nice, um, nice positioning where they're, they're normal to the sphere. Th yeah, perpendicular to the sphere. All right, then we are also changing the color with instance data. So this is another great way to bring data into our instancing, into our representation, by controlling the instance color with data. Uh, let's see, inside of the, this geometry component that I named data, gave it a descriptive name, we have a couple things in here. We have a, a tube, and I have cinched it at one end so that it's a cone. And I have these circle elements, and I'm using a different material for these. I'm using a wireframe, so we get these nice little circles around our cones because it looks nice. Let's see, what else do we have? Um, and then we have a camera, and it's looking at the center, basically. Um, and then I'm doing something else here. I have, I have this container, and I named this container UI. I have set the render top to be the background of this container, and I'm actually using this for render picking. So if I, um, please work, yes, it works, okay. I can pick different things, I can choose different instances, and my camera will fly to that instance, and I'm also highlighting it. So what, how's that happening? I'm using uh, render picking. Render picking is a way to interpret user input. So I'm clicking on this container. The container has panel, it's like a panel, which means that I can get uh, input from it, like clicks and mouse position. And render picking means that we're you know, interpreting that click and understand, projecting it into 3D to uh, understand which instance or like which thing in the 3D scene I'm clicking on as a user. Uh, so let's take a look at that. I have the render pick chop. How convenient that this exists as a chop. What have I changed about this? So I've set the render top on the render pick chop to be my render top, which is over here. Uh, I have set the panel, the, you know, where the, where the mouse clicks are coming from. The panel is my panel here, which I named UI. Um, and I am I turned on fetch instance ID. So if I don't have that here, then I had to turn on fetch instance ID here under options. And then here are the main parameters. Um, there's some parameters that I didn't adjust, such as the pick radius. You know, there's, there's, I could probably like bump this up to make it easier to choose an instance. Um, yeah, so render picking is a great way to have interaction with a 3D scene. Uh, so something funny was happening when I was building this, because I was like, oh, if I click this, it actually immediately moves the camera, right? So that means when I click it, then I'm, <laughs> I'm like instantly not clicking on the thing that I want to go to, so because the camera moves. And so what I did is I changed a few more parameters, and I made a script. So when I click on the instance that you know kind of updates things in my scene, um, and so even though what I'm clicking on changes later, it, it, anyway, so I, I basically kind of circumvented a problem. You don't have to know too much about it. It'll be fine. Uh, let's see. So I am getting these positions. When I, this is when I click on my, let me do this over here. When I click on my panel over here, I get a different instance. It tells me which instance I've clicked on. How am I using that information? I'm having this control a trim chop. So this trim chop is just taking our instance data, which is our whole set, right? All 100 instances and all of their positions and all of their colors. And I'm using the trim chop to pick one sample out of that based on, um, based on this, this picking. So uh, here I have my instance. I have a script that's updating my trim chop to be that instance number. And so I'm able to select that particular thing and get all of the information that I already put together about that thing. I am then 
using that, I'm instancing that single sample of data to be this, this pink highlight. So that's how that is coming in. And then I'm also using that information to control my camera position. Remember what I was saying about the camera just, you know, like the, the position of the instance is actually also like a normal, describes a normal. Uh, so the camera is just like further out from that, right? So uh, I can actually just take the position of my instance and scale it and get a position for my camera. That's pretty handy. Uh, so I'm doing a few more things to make the camera move in the way that I want. And one of the things that I'm doing is I'm converting from Cartesian to polar, um, doing all my smoothing in polar coordinates, and then converting back to Cartesian. And I'm doing the smoothing in polar coordinates because I, I want everything to move radially. I like want this, um, this nice round camera action. I'm going to show you what happens if I don't do that. It's not the same. It's not as nice. Uh, let's see. I'll make this longer. It's kind of subtle, but uh, but the camera moves. It moves really differently in relation to the sphere. You don't get the sense of the sphere just smoothly rotating around, right? Um, so here we are in this uh, this container, and you don't have to worry too much about this. Basically, I'm converting the chop data to dat data because I have this uh, this expression with you know um, using trigonometry to calculate the radius, the theta, and the phi of um, you know to convert this into polar. Then I'm able to use chops again to um, to do some some control of the rotation to introduce smoothing. And then I convert it back um, back to Cartesian. The reason that I'm converting it back to Cartesian is because of the camera up vector. It's like kind of it just keeps the camera orient. You have like another you know way to control camera orientation. So that's why I'm doing that. Uh, let's see. So take like five ten minutes to play around with this. You can do some of the things that we did before, or like you could change the color um, or play around with it. Just Try clicking on it. Just just make sure that you like have a grasp of some of the techniques that are being used here, so that it'll be easier to go into our next example, where we're looking at putting a lot more data on a sphere. All right, cool. So now I'm going to show you an example of using the same core technique of, you know, taking um, information. I mean, in this case, we kind of use made up information to position instances on a sphere. And this time, it'll be using actual lat-long data. So I'm going to close this file. And open this other file. Uh, so this, uh, this is a data visualization from a client project that I did. It's a visualization of this, this data here um, from Frack Tracker. Uh, let's see, what else do I want to say about this? So in, uh, in the folder here, assets, there's some data sets. And there's this folder, source data. Uh, you guys don't need to open this. Uh, I'll open it and show it to you in Excel. So these are the two CSV files that I downloaded from that website. So let's just, we'll take a minute. We'll look at the data like as I got it. And I'll tell you the story of how I interpreted it and then show you how I used it in Touch Designer. So these, each of these CSV files are about 500,000 uh, data points. They are the latitude, longitude, facility name, operator, um, state, and facility type of all of the oil and gas facilities in the United States. So a lot of these locations are um, fracking locations. So it's like you know, just basically just a well pad where they're um, extracting uh, natural gas. And uh, so 
once you have a lot of data like this, I do not recommend using DATS in Touch Designer. Um, anyone want to guess why? The files, the files really large, but you know computers can definitely handle like uh, 500,000 or a million things. But in Touch Designer, like you get a visual representation of everything, which means that it's rendering the dat. It's actually rendering all of that, and so we we don't really want to render it. And so uh, so when I have bring this data in in my touch file, I I turn off the display. Um, and that also means when I'm like when I was parsing this, it was faster to just parse it from a file into another file instead of bringing it into a dat. So just a little pro tip there. Uh, let's see. So when I look at this data, this is the data that I'm most interested in, latitude, longitude. Very convenient that this is already arranged. You know, like this is data that we can use very directly. Um, I can take this information and use just this information and ignore everything else and represent this data set. Let's see. There are two files. You see this is US OG Facil 2016 no TX, and then this is TX. This is because half of the oil and gas facilities in the United States are in Texas. <laughs> so the data is split very neatly in half by Texas and not Texas, which, I, which is kind of funny to me. So um, yeah, so I, when I was handling this, I actually just you know used Excel to copy these columns of data and bring this into, into here. So there's going to be, like for our next one, I'll tell the story of how I, I parsed out the states and did a count like per state for the number of oil and gas facilities. So that was the data. Here's the data in Touch Designer. Uh, it's just, see, this is going to take a second. It's going to be like, what? Um, so this is just, uh, you know, just, just three coordinates, comma separated. Um, uh, values. Oh, I might have actually converted these to uh, Cartesian for us already. So I have these. Um, yeah. So there's some more files in the in the data assets. So these are all things that I processed out for us. Uh, so. These positions, I'm turning these into TX and Y, chop data. You guys are like such experts at this now. Using instancing, using positioning, and then using my rotate to vector so that these are all normal to the sphere. What sphere I have this, uh, this map. This is a, you can see this in the background. This is a, a mesh. It's a a stock model of the world uh, with the different uh, meshes for the different states uh, of the United States. And so I took this 3D asset, this stock model, brought it into 3D, and then I um, adjusted, I scaled my data to match the mesh and like registered them together. So that was just, you know, like the same thing that we were doing at the beginning. It's like, oh, let's push these things around so that they are aligned and composed. Uh, let's see. So I have my two sets of instancing for Texas and not Texas. I have, uh, this is the geometry that's the map. These my different meshes. And um, yeah, so I'm rendering them all together. I'm putting on, let's see, let's look at the materials. Uh, I'm using this constant material, and this is just like a very low alpha white constant. It's set up to be additive so that when I render it, there's I'm doing render passes. So I'm rendering the globe, and then I'm separately rendering the data. And so because it's additive, it becomes kind of a heat map. There's like a million points in there, you know, like this low opacity. And so when they're all next to each other, they're added together, and so we get these areas of greater density where it's, it's white. And then because natural gas is blue, uh, I'm using a color ramp and a lookup top to map uh, that grayscale information to a palette to make it easier to see. And also, um, you know, the, the color has 
conceptual significance. Um, and then I'm compositing those together, and I have this map. So the this is a lot of information, and we can now explore it in 3D using our cameras. I, I have a bunch of different cameras set up here. And if we change our camera, we get some different views. So I can change this to camera one. Oh, I have to do this on both of my, both the render top and the render pass. So that's at a different position. I can, um, whoops. I can control, you know, I can s navigate my camera around just by controlling the rotation. And I have this hooked up. I can I can zoom in, zoom into Texas. Look at all those those gas pads. Uh, when I was doing this, I was like uh, I was like registering the the mesh with the data, and I was like, oh, I'm doing this wrong. There's all of these little dots that are that are not where they're supposed to be. And then I remember that Louisiana has a lot of oil and gas um, towers like off the coast, right? Like um, over the water. So we can see that there. Uh, something that I thought was really, there's something kind of beautiful about this visualization in my mind, which is that uh, it's kind of a map of geography, a certain kind of, um, you know, it's like sh shale and like, you know, it's a, the geology of these different places combined with political boundaries. And so you can see that, you know, there's this almost cloud-like formation of different different rock that has oil in it. And then it's like here going from Texas to Oklahoma. You know, Oklahoma probably has more regulation on fracking. And so there's there's not a lot of as many here. And then it picks up again going into, um, is that Wyoming? Sorry, I like don't even know my, my own states. Over here in Pennsylvania, we have a lot, um, there's like quite a lot of sites here and then also up in Michigan. So, and then California, LA was a an, a oil city before it was uh, an entertainment hub and so there's still a lot of oil and gas in Southern California. Let's see. Yes. Yes, I did. So that's right. So, um I think that the data is like normalized to the unit of 100, and then I scaled. Um, I wonder if I even did this here. I uh, I scaled the the globe, the stock model, which was totally arbitrary. I like scaled that geometrically to match the the data coordinates. Um, so yeah, let's see. Also, I, I, I did make this a long time ago, and so I'm kind of like, did I do that? I think I did. Uh, yeah, so here's the scaling. I scaled the, um, I scaled the map. I, I scaled the stock model to fit the, fit the data. So, you know, if I, like, misscale it, then it, you know, it doesn't match up. Uh, yeah, let's see. Um, and so I think the thing that I want you to take away from this is some of the camera animation. So uh, I set this up. If I turn this back on to be an expression, then this is driven by um, this speed chop. Is that working the way I think it should be working? Cam three, what? Oh, sorry, I wanted this to be controlled by this. Now it's like zooming really far away. Oh, sorry. This is why I don't live code. <laughs> like, uh, it's confusing for everyone. Let's try a different camera. Let's do camera five. Uh, yeah, so this one I set this up to kind of pan across, um, like northeast to southwest. And I could, um, 
I could bring it in closer. Which camera are we using? Camera five. Um, so I'm doing something with each of these cameras. I've changed the transform order. So I'm translating the camera before I rotate it, which means that I'm able to control that height, the radius, and then just like rotate it around. And that makes it a little bit easier to navigate. So if I restart this, restart this, pulse. Uh, so I can take my camera and use this to zoom in while it's moving. And so I, couldn't, I can make these like pretty nice camera animations over my data procedurally and also um, have a lot of different controls. So I can take the same data set and I could take my cameras and animate them so that I'm telling a certain story. Like maybe I'm following that, uh, you know, like the certain, um, you know, going across a certain swath of states or maybe I'm, you know, zooming out of one state. I can kind of tell different stories and like get into these different, you know, levels of detail with the data just by controlling the camera, and um, in a way that that it's a, you know it could be somewhat cinematic. Let's slow this down a little bit. Take this in even closer. You know, and there is a lot of detail to this. And so, you know, we can have this, this different these forms of exploration. Uh, yeah, so let's see. Let's take like 10 minutes for you guys to poke around this file. Um, I would suggest that you play around with the cameras and the camera animation in particular. And then uh, at 5 o'clock, we'll switch to the last example, which is the territories. So I thought I would quickly show you guys something kind of fun that I made for the class. Uh, in um, There's a, an extras folder, and I made something called a palette sorter. And you can drag and drop that into the network. And then I also provided in assets, there's a folder called palettes. These are color palettes. I got them from a website that will generate random palettes. Um, so you can just take one of these textures, and this will sort the palette so that the, the brightest is on the right and the darker one is on the left. And then we can uh, do something like just uh, kind of take over our lookup with this palette. And so once we have that set up, then we can just pick a different palette. Let's try this one. Um, and it's just really easy to change between them and find some different things that we like. So that's available to you. Uh, let's see. So let's go on to our next uh, geographic example. I'm going to close this. So in the folder states, we can open states.to, where about two thirds of the way through, you guys are doing great. Drink some water, stay hydrated. <laughs> uh, let's see. So this is a this is a different example. I actually took the same data set and I um, oh did did this break for me? This is awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, hmm. So I took the same data set. Let me. I'll just talk about the data for a second before I fix my file. Um, in this folder, I oh, th this is why it's not working actually. <laughs> okay, data um, master data. Let's see. Um, so I had taken the that file that we looked at before this this Excel file, and I you know there's states associated with all of this data. And I wanted to, you know, this information might be available somewhere else, but I wanted to take this data set and count how many um, different facilities were in each state. And so I uh, had, I took this, um, so I, I wrote the Python in a touch designer file. Of course, you could just run this using like a Python, like Python without touch designer, but I know that you all have touch designer installed, so this is one way to do it. And so I'll just take you through the, the very short Python snippet that I used to parse this data. 
Um, those of you who are familiar with Python will not be impressed. But if you uh, don't really use Python that much, hopefully this is of interest or of, of use. So uh, in my Python, I'm importing uh, CSV, which is a built-in library that helps us with comma-separated value um, files. And so then I am opening my file, the oil and gas facilities. Um, and I, I had output this as like a tab-separated um, file from the Excel. Uh, so I read each line. I strip it, which means I take away the tabs. And uh, then, oh, oh yeah, and so this is, I'd actually, I, I apologize. I took this column of data and I just saved it out, really. So it's just like a list of states. It's just this, you know, 500,000 state abbreviations. So I took, I didn't want to, I didn't, I was like, I don't need to parse all this data. I'll just save out just this one column and then parse that, right? Just keeping my life easier. Sometimes, you know, I want to like hang out with my friends. So, <laughs> uh, let's see. So then, so I just go through, read each line and like count how many um, instances there are of that, that text. So, um, and here I'm using a Python dictionary. Since uh, like with a Python dictionary, it's a, it's a data type in which uh, you can't have um, a data entry that's named the same as another data entry. And so I'm taking advantage of that to be like, oh, uh, if there's a data entry for Wyoming, then just count up, like add another count to the Wyoming count. And if you don't have anything in your dictionary for Wyoming, then Wyoming is equal to 1. And so like the next time Wyoming comes around, it like counts up. And so this is just like a very simple way to use this um, Python data structure to like count how many things are in the file without really, um, you know, while being pretty data agnostic. So I could use the same thing to count up the, the types or something like that. And then I write that file out um, as a CSV, and, and I'm done. Very simple. Um, so you can come back to that later. I'm not going to, you know, um, we're not going to worry too much about Python. Uh, this is the, this is what I get as a result of that, which is just, um, which is just uh, the state abbreviation with a comma and the number of facilities in that state. So for this, this next exercise, I needed to take, OK, I'm going to show you another example here. So the other thing that I needed to do was take that, uh, that model that I had, the stock model of the, the map, and I needed to figure out like which states in terms of mesh go with the data which is you know in this format and also to understand like what the position of each state is so that I have that as a, as a data set as well so I, I I'm like I have my data I'm interpreting my data and then I'm I need to associate my data and I need to generate a little bit more data based on on the meshes so this is all giving me errors because I have to load the meshes. I don't know why this isn't loading. I know why this isn't loading. OK. So I'll just show you one example of this. So the, um, the stock model, when I import the FBX, it has like a, a bunch of states in one. Um, I like brought in this FBX, and it came in in this format. And so I want to like save out each state mesh and associate that with a name. It had these uh, this information, so I knew it, like the this name is associated with the mesh group, so that was handy. I wanted to get the version of it that was um, not beveled, and so I actually, you know, th there's this list. There's a lot of redundancy, and so I, I manually said which lines of the this data I wanted. And then I used a replicator to delete everything except the thing that I wanted. It's really must be Wyoming. Um, and so then, then I have a script that just it's like go through every delete stop and save it out using the name. 
So this is another example of the work that goes into interpreting and parsing your data. Sometimes that's going to be purely text-based. Sometimes it might take the form of this, like I'm, I'm man manipulating meshes and like trying to take apart the meshes so that I can associate that with a clear name so that I can then associate that with this other data. So I did some of that lug work for you, but I think it's helpful for you to see what went into it. Um, let's see. So that allowed me to create this file where, oh yeah, the, the, other, the, other, the other missing piece was uh, this. I got this from GitHub. It's a text file <laughs> that very simply is like, this is the name of the state and this is the abbreviation. Because I had the abbreviations and I had the state names for the meshes and I, need, I wanted to associate them. And so I used this to, um, to look these things up and combine them together. So I have made for us this great file that has the state. Um, actually, I wonder if I still have that open. Let's see. So the state has the abbreviation. It has the number of oil and gas facilities. It has the name of the TOG that I saved out. And um, I also included the, the position data. Um, so I have I like did this work to bring all of the data together. And so now I can work to reference it and bring it into my scene and manipulate it within my scene. So I'm going to just take a minute to troubleshoot this, and I, I will not narrate that because I think it'll be confusing. OK, I think that I, those still had errors because it hadn't updated based on me importing the right data. So in your file, I think that you may need to make sure that you have loaded this data file, which is the usogmasterdata.txt. Oh, yeah, OK. OK, great. OK. Sorry, I tried to get all of that stuff before the workshop, but I missed some things. Uh, yeah, OK, so let's take a look at what's happening here. This is our, um, this is our USA. These are our territories. And I'm doing a lot of stuff inside of the geometry component. This isn't, I don't know, people have different styles. In this case, I'm doing so, like a lot of manipulation inside of the geometry component, a lot of logic in here. So. Within this geometry component that's representing the whole USA, um, I'm using a replicator. I have this, uh, this geometry component. Uh, the clone of that geometry component is the master for the replicator. And then it's replicating you know, this many times. And so there's a geometry component for every state. So let's take a look inside this parent. This parent is loading the mesh. This uh, is Alabama, the first state alphabetically. So we're using the, the, replicated, um, the replicator to load each mesh separately. That allows us to do things like give each state a different material very easily. And so we can do some logic that's like per state logic. In this case, um, I'm doing some chop calculation to choose a color that's representative of the number of oil and gas facilities in that state. So I have, I'm like pulling the, uh, like pulling in a lot of information, including um, over here, sorry. Over here is where, I'm, this is the number of oil and gas facilities. Um, Texas is the maximum, and so I'm you know, creating the fraction of that, I'm dividing the number in Alabama by the number in Texas. That gives me a number. And I'm using that to look up a color from my palette. And so then I'm applying that to my material. And that material is then being applied to the, um, the geometry component with the render parameter, the material parameter. And so that is giving me um, this color-coded map so now we have a color-coded expression based on territory of the number of oil and gas facilities in every state. Those colors are being controlled by this ramp. 
um, which is here. Sorry, it's inside USA. This was the first ramp that I made. This is a linear ramp. So this goes from, you know, uh, let's look at the keys here. Excuse me. This ramp goes from white at 0 to yellow at 0.25 to orange at 0.5 to red at 0.75 to dark red at 1. And because Texas is so extreme compared to the other states, it just, you know, like, like this, I mean, this tells the story pretty accurately in that, like, th it's very extreme. But we lose the ability to really differentiate between the other states, right? And so I actually kind of prefer um, this other ramp, which is where we're going to get a more exaggerated difference in the, in the middle one. So there are some representational choices here. Are we trying to tell the story about like, what, how insane people are in Texas? Or are we trying to make it easier to differentiate between these other states? So you know, California does have significantly more um, oil and gas facilities than Michigan, but we weren't really able to see that before. So we have some choices in our representation. And, and we can make that really easily and play around with it parametrically um, because we've done this work to associate, you know, like the simple ramp with all of our states and mesh data. So we've kind of done this work to make it easy to, to try different options and parameters. Let's see. Uh, I also have done a little bit of logic to, um, you know, it's like I'm bringing in this information. Like, if I want to pick a state, I'm bringing that information in here and can use that to change, um, to change some things. Uh, and I'll show you that in a second. So now I am going to switch cameras. Now that we've seen the whole scene, I'm going to switch to this camera. This camera is animated. I'm going to change this to cam and animation by dragging and dropping it. And so this camera is flying over the map. And right now, it's picking randomly between different states and flying between them and displaying the number of oil and gas facilities for that state. Um, I'm going to turn this thing on. Where is it? Sorry, let me find this. This kind of thing is invaluable when you're doing this kind of work. Um, I have a, a debug marker. So this piece of geometry is being located at the centroid for each state mesh as I go to it. So this is you know, making it easier for me to troubleshoot what I'm doing and make sure that what, I, what I'm intending to do is working. Um, because you, you can see that with the, the states color coded like this, it's not really clear like, which one I'm supposed to be looking at. The, you know, we're not representing the information in a way that really matches up with what we're doing. So I, I have another um, material strategy for this. I'm going to go into my state parent, and I'm going to switch the material here to 0. And so now it's highlighting that state. So I can turn off my debug marker now. So here I've brought in some of the animation techniques that we're looking at. I'm lagging you know, on the, the color, so it fades out when it's deselected and fades in when it's selected. Oh, we're going to Alaska. <laughs> uh, this isn't totally refined. <laughs> Let's see. So I think like sometimes the rotations it like goes all the way around the world. Um, so there's still more to work out with this. Uh, I'm actually, you know, I'm not compositing this text with the render top. This text is once again it's put on a card and it's in the scene, and so it's actually um, the camera is parented to the label. So this is in camera space, but it's still being rendered in our 3D scene. So when you want to bring a lot of text into your data visualization, you don't want to have a bunch of tops comping one after the other and like do all of that. It's a lot easier to bring all of your text into the 3D scene on cards and position it there. Um, and you can do that both in, the, in like the scene, as we were doing with our isometric data visualization, or you can connect it to the camera and have it be in a consistent position in camera space. Um, so that's another technique for bringing text in. So you can see 
here is that label. Um, and uh, you know, if I want to move it around, I can change where it is. Um, but this, this is in camera space, and so I could change my layout pretty easily um, in that way. What else do I want to show you? Um, so I made this box. Uh, this is this is really just picking a random state, and then you know, like the everything updates based on this kind of simple script. Um, I'm doing a random search that's inspired by Maximus P. Actually, there's a, a random function in Max called earn, and it's like if you imagine having a bowl and you put in like your, or like um, and you put in a bunch of numbers. Then you randomly pick a number and you take it out, and then you pick a number and you take it out. It's that approach to randomness, because you know, if you just pick a random number, you could pick five, and then you could pick five again, and, and that isn't great from a UX perspective. It's, it feels like things are broken. And so, using an earn method, it's uh, pretty unlikely that you're going to pick the same thing twice in a row because you're going to pick everything randomly before you recycle. So, um, here's an implementation of that. Um, I'm making a table. I'm copying my data into this table. And then when the timer is up, I pick a row from the table, delete it, and update with that number. Uh, so if you like Python, y you can read that. Uh, this is also an area where we could add more interactivity. Maybe instead of just having this random state picker, you could actually have an interface and have people choose a state. And that's really set up for that to happen there, and then for it to be really easy for you to update the rest of the scene and have all of the, all of the animation will continue um, continue working. And so that's, that's pretty well separated. Let's see. Uh, yeah, do you guys have any questions about this at the moment before you take a crack at it? OK. Um, so. Take a look around. Take a spin around. Um, I'm going to challenge you guys to uh, bring in some, some color information back in and, uh, and to build out a little bit more um, to find another way to control which state is being chosen. A couple people have gotten a bug on the script in the search component uh, on the timer. And to fix that, we ran this the earn script. We like the table was empty, and so we ran this to fill the table, and then restarted the timer. So if you're running into that error, try that. Yeah. So if we wanted to, we can just. Uh, this is updating. Sorry, I'm sorry. I should have showed you guys this actually. In um, inside of the geometry component USA, in Project One USA, um, there is this. This should be like highlighted because this is just this is more important. This is the the whole control of which state is just happening right here. So if I stop the timer, um, I'm gonna stop it. If I stop the timer and I go up in my network so we can see what's happening, I can just pick whatever state I want based like numerically. So this is going to the 22nd state, which is Michigan. If we go to the, uh, should be, oh yeah, we're skipping Hawaii, by the way, because they don't have any and they're too far away. Um, West Virginia, go through some different states. And so if you want to um, control this scene in a different way, you can just simply control this number in a different way. That's all you have to do. Uh, so I think that's all of the, the wisdom I'm going to share with you in this workshop. I really appreciate you guys coming. Um, yeah, it's really fun hanging out for the afternoon. I hope you all make really cool data visualizations. I'd love to keep in touch and like see what you guys do. Um, 
you know, if, if you want to send me the stuff that you made today, I'd be really, really, that'd make me really happy. So, um, yeah, and then I'll see you around the rest of the conference. I'd love to chat with you more throughout the conference and hear about, like, what you're interested in and, and uh, yeah, what you plan to do with all of this. So, yeah, thanks a lot for coming, and I'll, I'll hang out for the next. Ah. <laughs> thanks, you guys. I'll, I'll st stick around for the next 10 minutes for, like, you know, your final questions and stuff like that. So thanks a lot.